Most people unknowingly step over signs of high-value minerals. A faint shimmer in river gravel or along a hillside trail is often dismissed as quartz or glass. But these are the exact places where raw diamonds and sapphires quietly appear. The most common mistake? Expecting bright colors, clarity, or cut. None of which describe these stones in their natural state. In the field, both rough diamonds and sapphires are visually subtle. Sapphires can appear blue-gray, mossy green, yellowish, or even dull. Raw diamonds tend to be translucent, with brown, green, or pale yellow hues and irregular surfaces. The difference between a worthless rock and a potential gem begins with three key indicators. Luster, density, and crystal habit. Diamond luster is adamantine, dry, sharp, and unusually reflective even under a film of dirt. Sapphires typically show a greasy to vitreous luster, especially when wet. A simple field trick is to dip the stone in clean water. This enhances surface reflection and helps rule out quartz, which reflects light more diffusely. Density is one of the most reliable cues, even without a scale. Quartz, common in rivers, has a specific gravity of about 2.65. Diamond is 3.52. Sapphire is denser still, around 3.95 to 4.05. Practically speaking, if a small, unassuming pebble feels too heavy for its size, it deserves a closer look. The smaller and denser, the more likely you're holding something valuable. Crystal form is equally revealing. Despite water wear, many sapphires retain hexagonal or barrel-like edges. Diamonds may hint at octahedral symmetry, triangular patterns or flat facets that subtly resist full rounding. Rotate the stone in direct light. Unusual angles or planes often emerge that quartz and feldspar lack. Recognizing this trio, luster, weight, and form, turns any hike through rocky terrain or a stream bed into a low-tech gemstone survey. But even stones that pass these initial tests can still be misleading. What if that shine is just volcanic glass or a high-index fake? That's where deeper testing begins. In field identification, the first serious mistake isn't ignoring value, it's trusting the wrong signals. Color can mislead, clarity is unreliable, and sparkle alone is easily faked. What matters instead is how the stone behaves under light and motion. The goal at this stage isn't to confirm a gem, but to eliminate what it clearly isn't. That begins with surface behavior, microtexture, and directional light response. Under direct sunlight or strong LED, common rocks like quartz and feldspar reflect light diffusely, almost milky, with a soft glow that follows the curve of the stone. Diamond and sapphire candidates, by contrast, reflect light in localized flashes. These are brief, angle-specific gleams, not a general shine. It's most noticeable when slowly rotating the stone. Flashes appear, vanish, and reappear from different faces or edges. This is due to their internal crystal structure and refractive index, about 2.42 for diamond, and around 1.76 to 1.77 for sapphire. Quartz sits far lower, around 1.54, and it shows. There's also texture. Raw sapphire often feels slightly greasy or matte to the touch, especially when dry. Quartz feels cooler, smoother, almost glass-like. Diamond, particularly industrial-grade or rough octahedral specimens, can feel gritty or oddly sharp-edged, like fine sandpaper or chipped ceramic. This is a subtle cue, but in combination with light behavior, it helps build a candidate profile. One more trick. Tap the stone lightly against your teeth or a metal tool. Quartz produces a dull tick. Corundum and diamond give a higher-pitched, sharper tap due to their density and elasticity. This isn't definitive, but it adds another fast layer of field logic. At this point, you filter dozens of river stones down to a handful of real contenders, but one false signal remains stubbornly common. Some glassy fragments mimic all these traits. 
and they're often the most convincing fakes in the field. The next step is to bring in physics. Glass is the great deceiver. In riverbeds and hillsides, weathered fragments of volcanic glass, man-made waste, or even worn-down bottle shards can mimic the look and feel of raw gemstones. They can exhibit sharp luster, surprising density, and even the occasional pseudo-crystal shape. But field tests grounded in physics can begin to separate illusion from true mineral value, and none require advanced equipment. The first tool is polarized light, and it's as simple as a pair of polarized sunglasses. Hold the suspect stone up against the sky or a white background and slowly rotate it while looking through the lens. Glass, being isotropic, typically shows no change in brightness. But some natural crystals, including corundum, sapphire, are anisotropic and exhibit changes in light transmission as they turn. This test isn't decisive, but it can tip the balance toward or away from further testing. Next is magnet sensitivity, especially valuable for identifying diamond indicator minerals. While diamonds themselves are not magnetic, their companions often are. A basic neodymium magnet, swept across a pan of concentrates, can isolate ilmenite or magnetite. These heavies often travel with diamonds in kimberlite-derived sediments. If your suspect stone is found near black sands that respond to a magnet, the context becomes more favorable. Another practical test, transparency underwater. Submerge the stone in clear water and observe it against a white background. Glass often shows internal bubbles, flow lines, or curved fracture patterns called conchoidal breaks. True crystals exhibit more uniform translucency or directional zoning. Diamonds, for instance, may look clouded but will not display air bubbles. Sapphires might reveal internal rutile needles or color zoning. Both are natural signatures. Touch matters too. Glass warms quickly in the hand, while minerals like corundum retain a cooler temperature longer due to higher thermal mass. And if you tap the stone gently on porcelain or ceramic, glass tends to leave a faint white streak or may even chip. True sapphire will scratch the surface without damage to itself, thanks to its Mohs hardness of 9. With just polarized light, a magnet, water, and awareness of temperature and fracture, you can eliminate 80% of glass imposters in the field. What remains deserves more structured testing, especially if black sand and weight point to deeper potential. But even among true minerals, not all shine leads to value. The next step is separation through sieving. At a riverbank or eroded hillside, raw surface clues rarely tell the whole story. The real test begins with concentration. To reveal whether sapphires or diamonds are present, you must isolate the heavies, minerals with higher specific gravity that settle into predictable locations. This means moving from visual scans to controlled sampling. Using a classifier set, typically number 20, 0.85 mm, and number 40, 0.425 mm, mesh sizes, you screen out large debris, retaining the finer sediments where small rough gems hide. A flat pan or a batte then comes into play. With gentle swirling, you separate lighter material from dense particles. The key is the tail formation. Heavy minerals collect at the bottom edge, forming a crescent. If you're seeing black sand, garnet, or metallic flakes consistently, the location has promise. Focus especially on traps, the inside bends of creeks, gravel bars downstream of bedrock outcrops, or natural riffles in eroded channels. These act as density filters in nature. Sapphires with their higher SG, 4.0, concentrate more efficiently than quartz. Diamonds settle slightly above magnetite, but often travel with pyrope garnet and ilmenite. Don't just inspect the top layer. Dig just above the false bedrock or compacted clay lenses, where density locks particles in place. Zervan, a geological wild card that mimics the weight, color, and even luster of both sapphire and diamond, but fails under scrutiny. In many terrains, 
especially in ancient river systems and metamorphic belts, zircon appears as small, rounded crystals with vitreous shine and high specific gravity, 4.6. Found in the same size range and density as corundum, it often fools the pan and the eye. But zircon's betrayals are specific. Under magnification, it shows rounded crystal faces and frequent internal fractures. More decisively, under long-wave UV light, zircon may fluoresce yellow or orange, distinct from the faint blue of many diamonds or the dull response of sapphires. It also lacks the thermal conductivity of a diamond and won't scratch porcelain as confidently as corundum. Zircon is not worthless. It's even used in radiometric dating and has its own gem varieties, but mistaking it for sapphire or diamond can lead to costly assumptions, especially in terrains rich in granitic or gneissic material, where zircon is abundant. This false positive must be ruled out before escalating exploration. Once zircon is eliminated and heavier candidates remain, it's time to apply precise field procedures. Visual tests and pan work narrow the field, but only repeatable process confirms legitimacy. Reliable field identification requires repeatable process, not luck or isolated guesses. Once a target zone produces credible candidates, you must grid, document, and test with consistency. This is where casual prospecting ends and disciplined fieldwork begins. Start by marking your sampling sites with GPS and noting water conditions, substrate type, and depth of material processed. Create a numbered grid if working a hillside slope or terrace. Use consistent sieve sizes and record volume per pan. 5 to 10 liters per sample is typical. Photograph every pan result and candidate stone, including dry and wet views. For every positive pan, e.g., with black sand, garnet, or visible candidates, flag the site for repeat sampling. Replication is key. A single lucky pan proves nothing, but three or more consistent concentrates signal a mineralized zone worth deeper attention. As you build a profile, begin cross-testing samples. Perform magnet passes, UV light inspection, and visual grading under a loop. If a stone consistently scores positive on weight, light behavior, and microstructure, it's a candidate for controlled testing. The payoff isn't just in the stone, it's in the pattern. Reproducibility builds both confidence and value. And as you scale your process, the importance of confirmatory tools becomes unavoidable, especially for diamond verification. Thermal conductivity testing is the turning point for field-level diamond evaluation. This tool, pocket-sized and widely available, applies a brief pulse of heat to the stone's surface. Diamonds dissipate heat almost instantly, triggering the probe signal. Quartz, feldspar, zircon, and most fakes fail this test completely. However, one exception consistently causes trouble, moissanite. It shares similar thermal conductivity with diamond and can trigger a false positive. But moissanite has a critical weakness, electrical conductivity. While diamonds are insulators, moissanite often conducts electricity. Combination testers now exist that read both properties in seconds. Before applying any probe, ensure the stone is clean, dry, and unmounted. Dirt, moisture, or metal settings can disrupt readings. Hold the candidate stone with plastic tweezers to avoid heat transfer and test at multiple points, especially on flat surfaces. For sapphires, thermal testing isn't diagnostic, but optical aids can help. Under 10x magnification, real corundum often shows internal zoning, rutile needles, silk, or twinning. Glass imitations tend to be flawless, with curved flow lines or bubbles. If zoning follows the crystal shape, it's a strong sign of natural origin. Still, even with conductivity tools and optical clues, a dangerous mirror image remains. Moissanite, especially in stream-worn form, looks and tests like diamond. Without one more test, the risk of misidentification remains high. 
Moissanite is the near-perfect imposter. With a hardness of 9.25, strong luster, and thermal conductivity nearly identical to diamond, it routinely fools both sellers and field testers. What unmasks it is double refraction, a property where incoming light splits into two paths as it passes through the crystal. To test this, you need a jeweler's loop, 10x or higher, and a well-lit environment. View the stone at an angle and look through a flat surface. If facet edges appear doubled, slightly blurry or split, you're likely dealing with moissanite. Diamond, by contrast, is singly refractive. Facet lines remain sharp and singular. Moissanite also tends to show a greenish or yellowish overtone under direct light, whereas diamonds scatter white light more cleanly. Another tell. Moissanite often fluoresces under long-wave UV light in ways diamonds typically do not showing green or yellow glow versus the classic weak blue of most natural diamonds. These tests are crucial in the field, especially when sourcing from tailings, river gravels, or artisanal pits where simulants may have been discarded or mixed in. A single misread can lead to unnecessary cutting costs or even fraudulent sales if the stone enters the market unverified. With moissanite filtered out, the field now narrows to only legitimate candidates, stones that pass pan, weight, light, conductivity, and optical testing. But are they truly worth cutting, certifying, or selling? For that, we must look at context, origin, and price logic.